Hello, everybody. This is Steve Gorin. I'm, I'm doing my first webinar based on my newsletter. Everybody should know that on slide four, there's a link uh, to all of my to all the various materials, um, including my my newsletters, some supplemental materials I prepared, uh, some materials from Steve Akers, um, and and so you should go ahead and download those. Um, so go and print them off and. Uh, then, be, then we can you can follow a little bit better. Uh, particularly, the ones that I'm going to be speaking from are the ones that that stay that are uh, linked, saying uh, Goran materials, and those say proposed regulations under Code Section 2704 at the top, excerpted from um, structuring businesses of private home businesses tax and estate implications, and those are the very top of that slide. Before I get into the substance. Um, I have to tell you that I can't, recently came across the IRS's motto, and the IRS's motto is, we have what it takes to take what you have. So today we're going to be going over, and I'm on slide three, um, the proposed regulations under Code Section 2704. I'll spend about the first half, half an hour or so, maybe a little bit more, uh, talking about uh, just a, a very brief overview about um, how they relate to each other, and then some of the provisions, and then get to talk about some planning provisions. Um, and I'm not really going to get into a ton of detail about all the in-depth things about how these work. There are lots of great uh, seminars that are an hour and a half or more long. Um, yesterday in particular, there was one that the American Bar Association Real Property Trust and State Law section offered um, featuring uh, Jonathan Blotmacher, Carlin McCaffrey, and Diana Zadel, and um, you can get that from the ABA Real Property Trust and State Law section. Uh, ACTEC did another one um, through ALI uh, about a month or two ago, and uh, you can you can listen to that. And there's plenty of other ones. Um, I'm, after I talk about the proposed regulations under 2704, some people had mentioned that one thing they would do is is recommend doing tenants in common instead of um, having um, partnerships, and I'm going to mention um, what that what that might entail and some of the pros and cons of it. Uh, I will then kind of talk about um, avoiding income tax of, of life insurance and buy sell agreements, uh, and this is uh, again all from my newsletter. Uh, and this is again my first uh, webinar. I'm going to be doing quarterly um, after each of my newsletters about a month afterwards. Um, so I'm going to just spend maybe about five minutes talking about that life insurance issue, and then after that I'll wrap back and see if there's any more questions on the 2704. And then, then finally, I just want to mention that the American College of Trust and Estate Council, ACTEC, is going to be putting in some uh, some comments to the government. Those comments are on the verge of being released. I'm not quite sure when they will be. Um, they were projected to be released sometime this week. but there's a web page there that, that takes you to ACTEC's general web page for government submissions. And you won't find them there now, but uh, if you check early next week, you should be able to find them. And they're, they're very detailed comments talking about some of the concerns that ACTEC has about different ways one might be able to interpret these proposed regulations and some changes that they think are needed or that the government should consider. And we'll talk about um, to whom Code Section 2704 proposed regulations apply. We're going to talk about uh, lapses, disregarding applicable restrictions, if and when the proposed regs will be finalized, and some planning issues. So to whom it would apply, uh, and, and it's very important to understand um, which, which uh, that this doesn't apply to everybody. It applies to family-controlled businesses. And a family-controlled business generally is when the family owns 50% or more of the business. So if the family owns less than 50%, um, then you don't have to worry about these, these proposed regulations or generally about 2704. So only if the family um, and the transfer together own at least 50% do you have to worry about that. One, one little nuance to that. Suppose you have two unrelated parties that own an entity 
um, this would actually apply to each one of them. Even though they're deadlocked and even though they can't do a doggone thing without the unrelated party's consent, um, they still, each of them would be con considered as having a family controlled entity. And that's a matter of the statute. That is not a matter of the regulations. So um, those who want to complain about that, you need to complain to Congress. Okay, let's now talk about generally um, what 2704 has. Uh, and there really are three aspects to the regulations. 25.2704-1, and then dash two, and dash three. And the materials um, that were in that second bullet point of the fourth slide, those materials um, go through those in more depth. But let me just give you a general overview of how they kind of fit together. 2704-1 talks about value that disappears without being transferred. And if you follow along my proposed regulations under 2704 um, article, um, you will find this on page five, where it says proposed reg 25.2704-1 regarding lapses. So value that disappears without being transferred. So what are we talking about? First of all, value that permanently disappears because of a change in rights. So an example of that would be, um, suppose you have a partnership interest that gets transferred or an LLC interest and and the and the and the and the interest is given away, but the person has not been admitted as a part as a, as a partner or a member. Well, the person who gave all that away does not own it anymore, and the person who received it they're an assignee because they haven't gotten admitted yet as a partner or a member, and as an assignee they don't have any voting rights or rights to information. So those those rights have permanently gone away. Um, so, so that's your traditional lapse, um, and they've added another one, which is um, if one dies um, too soon after the transfer, then the rights are brought back into your estate because it reduced the value of your retained interest in the entity by reason of losing control. So, for example, let's suppose – one owns 80% of the interest and then gives away 40% and, they, and you have only 40% left. Well, before they transfer, you had an 80% supermajority vote. You could do almost anything you wanted. After you gave away that 40%, you didn't have the supermajority anymore, and so your control went away. Now, the voting rights that went along with that didn't go away. Each person who received the interest got the voting rights, um, but your control over the entity, it went away as a practical matter. And so what you need to do is, is, is um, what happens is then is if you die too soon after the transfer, then that control that you had is brought back into your estate. And the, the proposed regulation said, that, well, we're concerned about transfers and contemplation of death, and so they put in a three-year rule that if you give away, in my example, this 40%, and you die within three years, then the whole value is brought back in, into your estate. Um, now, this really is excessive. Suppose you had somebody who's you know, 50 years old, they're in good health, they've got a life expectancy of some 30 years, and they give it away, and the next day they get hit by a bus. So now they've had a state inclusion. They didn't do it in contemplation of death. They didn't think they were going to go hit by the bus, but they did. Um, and, and think about your clients who have uh, marital deduction estate plans where they say, okay, I'm going to leave the exemption maybe, amount maybe to my kids, and the rest of it I'm going to take, I'm going to put into a marital deduction trust, I'm going to get an unlimited marital deduction, and there's going to be no estate tax. Let's suppose somebody with that kind of plan made a gift like this. Well, um, when that person, and suppose that person then dies within that three-year period, like I said, they get hit by the bus. So they get hit by the bus, 
that value is included in their estate, okay, but it doesn't really pass to anybody. It doesn't pass to the surviving spouse. So the value gets included in their estate, but there's no way to take a marital deduction for it. So this person who had this, this plan that is not going to have any estate tax at all, um, by, by giving it away and, and losing control and then getting hit by the bus, um, they've incurred a tax liability that they, wouldn't have, that they wouldn't have if they hadn't gotten it away. Now, it would, to me, it would be a little bit uh, too much to say, well, gee, then they should never give it away because um, you obviously want them to do it. So I think you'll see some comments in there from a number of sources that say, you know, look, this three-year rule is arbitrary. It really, you know, you set it for contemplation and death. Well, say what you mean. What you should do is you should just say, suppose if if they're not expected to live, we have we have rules under the code section 7520 regs, um, and and they say that you know if you if you die too soon and you can't prove that you were supposed to live, um, then you don't get to you don't get to count it as if you're going to live. So. So we already have rules for things where somebody is not in a good health situation. So let's apply the existing rules where people are in a good situation, and we could maybe call that contemplation of death. Um, but having an arbitrary three-year rule is just, it's just way over the top. Um, but that's, that's what these proposed regs say. So then uh, going on in, my, in, my, in those materials to page seven, we talk about um, 2704-2 and 2704-3. So, again, 2704-2 is basically a restriction on the value that later can lapse or be removed. So, right now, the donor or the decedent, they had the right to liquidate. When they transferred it, the transferee also had the right to liquidate, but it goes away at some point, or it could be removed by the family at some point. So for those situations, um, you, have, um, you have those restrictions that can be disregarded. And, and an applicable restriction can arise under the entity's governing documents or applicable law. And when they talk about applicable law, uh, you, can, you can take a look, by the way, at the bottom of page 7 at footnote 4326. It, it, it cites the source of the limitation. And if you flip on to the next page on page 8 of, the, of my materials, um, I have a quote there in footnote 4327 that talks about imposed by st federal or state law. And these um, imposed by law uh, this is something very different than what we're used to. We're used to it saying that if the state law would normally impose a restriction absent you doing something, that we're going to respect that restriction. However, what this says is that if the restriction under the governing law is something that you can do away with, then we are going to disregard that restriction. So. If the governing law says it takes unanimous vote to liquidate the entity and the owners can agree to allow only 51% to liquidate the entity, um, then that's an applicable restriction, and we're going to ignore the unanimity requirement and, and, um, and then perhaps say a 51% requirement. Now, this rule is um, it's, it's, it's very um, potentially onerous. Um, we don't know what a provision in state law that would be disregarded is. Uh, now, the government says, oh, you know, it's one of those bells and whistles that, uh, that people have been trying to jazz up to get discounts. Um, but if you think about it, any entity will have laws on, on how you form the entity, and how you dissolve the entity. By definition, state law is going to tell you how you get in and how you get out. So if you have restrictions on, on how, how, what are the rules for how you get in? Well, the regulations could say, 
Well, I'm, I'm sorry, how you get out. The regulations can say, well, we're going to kind of remove those restrictions. We're going we're gonna to ignore some of the restrictions on how you get out. So just think about it. If you were in your car um, and, and, your, and your car is kind of face downhill and you have the brakes on, so your car is stopped. Um, now, the IRS does not have the regulation that says we are going to require you to, to say that you're going. But what the IRS could say is we're going to disregard the fact that your foot is on the brake, and we're going to pretend that it wasn't on the brake. And so now your car is going to start rolling. So it's not like the IRS has added a liquidation right. It simply said we're going to disregard impediments to liquidating. Um, now, nobody really knows, and the IRS really hasn't articulated what these provisions are. Um, I have some informal um, indication that the IRS would say if the restriction requires more than a majority vote, then they would disregard anything more than a majority vote. Um, but that's just really informal. You never know what the final regulation could come out with. So I would not assume that that's the case. Um, but I just wanted to point out what, um, what, what might wind up being acceptable. So let's, let's go to, to the Dash 3 regs on page 9 of my materials. And, and this talks about restrictions under governing documents and state law that um, they're going to be disregarded so you can increase the value of what was transferred. So again, how does this fit in? The dash one is rights that go away when you make the transfer. Dash two is rights that at some point can lapse or be removed by the family. And, 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 and basically in neither case did, you know, did the, did the were they actually transferring um, these rights? Uh, and, 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 and the dash three, these rights to liquidate exist before and after the transfer. And on, and on page nine um, for the dash three, I, I go through the different provisions that are disregarded. One of them is, um, the provision limits or permits the, the limitation of the ability to compel liquidation. Um, so it, it can be a provision of state law. Um, another one is one um, that allows you to liquidate and receive something less than minimum value. And minimum value, it's, it's very controversial what minimum value really means. Um, and, and minimum value is probably a very inflated value but there are people who disagree on the scope of how much that would be inflated. Another is that the provision um, allows a payment to be delayed, um, or, and then the last one is the payment would be, to, would be paid in something other than cash. Uh, and they do have an exception um, for, for family businesses. You can get paid in a note that's, that's, that starts its amortization right away, um, if you are an, if you are an operating business, um, one of the big problems with these rules when you talk about well who can take it away does the family have control over it? And if we flip over um, to page uh, fourteen, it talks about um, the different. Uh, what a family member, what a non-family member's ownership counts or doesn't count. And, and on page 14, I mentioned that um, a non-family member's ownership is disregarded unless all of the following are satisfied. First of all, the non-family member held it for at least three years. Um, it would be nice if they had an exception in the regs that talked about um, somebody who owned it for three years and then transfer it to another non-family member and they, we should be able to attack the periods. Um, and you probably will see commas talk about that, but um, but the but the regs don't mention that. You have to own at least they have to own at least 10%, um, and 
and then all family mem all non family members have to own at least twenty percent combined, and each non family member has to have a put right. Now this last one is the is the big one, and and it's one that you'll never be able to satisfy, never ever ever. So the put right, first of all, the put right is is one that has to be satisfied by where well, you can sell it within six months and get the note and have the note be for at least minimum value. So number one, minimum value is inflated, so probably people wouldn't want to um, sell it for that anyway. But number two is just thinking about family businesses and how they work, or just any operating business. Businesses generally need capital to run. And they can't have their capital be subject to being yanked away by any member who wants to at any time. It doesn't promote stability. It doesn't let them uh, get, get loans from their for lines of credit. Um, there's no operating business who I've ever heard of that lets anybody just get redeemed with, within six months notice and get cashed out. Um, not if it's an operating business. So this is something that you'll never see. There will be, never be a non-family member who will qualify under this test. And therefore, if the family owns at least 50% of the entity, it's gonna be deemed as owning all of the entity and being deemed to be able to remove all restrictions on liquidation. So that is really the ultimate upshot of, of the Dash 3 regulations. And again, the issue is, you know, how would you uh, do the valuation? Um, regarding the effective date, um, so the effective date um, has a couple of different tiers to it. Um, and and here they are. Um, so so first of all, um, generally, so the, the, the dash one regs on the lapses of rights are, they apply to lapses of rights if the rights were created after October 8th, 1990. Um, and now the way that that effective date is written, it makes it look like maybe, suppose you make a transfer uh, oh, and by the way, so if lapses of rights created after 1990, if the lapses occur on or after the date that the regs become final. So the question is, what if you make a transfer, then the regulations become final, and then the person dies and has a deemed lapse? And, um, and the answer to that is that um, informal indications are that Treasury did not intend to apply to that situation. So what would really apply would be that if the um, if the transfer occurred before the regulation is finalized, then you're not going to count a lapse. Uh, then um, the dash two regs are proposed to become effective um, at when the final regs become uh, published, and the dash three regs are proposed to be effective um, 30 days after the date they become published. Um, and again, those are all for restrictions created after October 8th, 1990. Um, so we're going to, um, you know, if you have existing um, restrictions that, that are really old, then you might be able to just grandfather them in. So those are the effective dates. We talked about um, the regulations that may be disregarded, um, owners whose interests may be disregarded. Uh, now let's talk about the possible effect on valuation. So valuation, it's a, it's a really touchy thing. And um, like I said, we don't know what, what is gonna be considered and what isn't. If you flip to page 17 of my materials, where I go through the 2704 discussion, um, there's a bunch of questions that appraisers have asked. Um, tenancy in common, rights of first refusal, um, a history of redemptions would tend to affect value. Um, with an at-will general partnership, um, an, an auditor would say there's no discount, um, but there is some time it takes to, to liquidate, and that can cause a delay and uncertainty. For an, so an at-will general partnership, uh, examiners argue that there's no discounts, but there, you know liquidation does take some time. 
Um, there's one appraiser who reported that the liquidation process was going to be cumbersome and lengthy, and he reported a 20% discount, even though it was in the process of liquidation. Um, appraisers should can scrutinize control premiums because deriving them from the public market um, doesn't really count, doesn't really tell the whole story from minority discounts. Minority owners cannot control what's going on in a business, and so if you have salaries are a little bit high, rent is getting paid is too high, a minority owner cannot affect that, um, whereas a control person can. So control means different things for different types of businesses. Um, other, other issues, environmental liabilities, key man risks, agreements to lock in executive compensation, other business issues, those can be larger than discounts. Um, family members, um, even though we, we have to assume that a family can, can disregard liquidation restrictions, a hypothetical willing buyer might not really want to be in business with that particular family because of how they're managing the business. Um, another thing to consider is personal goodwill because a lot of times the founder is the one who's driving the business and the founder doesn't have a non-compete business, in pl uh, non-compete agreement in place, and so you might be able to separate the founder's own vision and skills as a separate asset, and and uh, and have the appraisal appraisal consider that. Um, lenders' restrictions on the ability to liquidate. Now, the proposed regs do consider certain restrictions that are imposed by, by commercial lenders and other equity investors who are providing capital to an operating business. Um, other things, um, the right to minority oppression lawsuit adds value under current law, um, and, and uh, disregarding minority discounts would disregard the value given to that premium. Um, if a family is cohesive, they might not let an unrelated party uh, get out so quickly, so the, the hypothetical willing buyer um, would would need to consider the fact that they're kind of going to be stuck. You may have owners who have who are difficult to deal with. Uh, maybe they impose reputational risks, um, and uh, who knows what kind of recordings they may have that pop up later. Um, and and also um, they may be complex corporate structures. Um, so you also want to do a liquidity analysis regarding cashing out owners. So there's a lot of different factors that can come in with valuation. So timing. So the Treasury has said um, that they're not, informally, that they are not in a rush to finalize these proposed regulations. And, um, and in fact, it was pointed out that they could have required comments to be within 60 days, and instead they gave us 90 days. So they gave us an extremely generous 90-day period in which to comment. Um, and so, that, so, so therefore, they're really not necessarily in so much of a hurry. Um, and another, con another point is that um, as of Tuesday of last week, they had, received, they had processed 200 comments, and they had received but not yet processed another 3,200 comments. Now, a lot of those comments were kind of like, um, get your hands out of my pocket, and so they, they're not really going to have to spend a lot of time analyzing that. Um, but, but it will take them a while to go through that, and, and, and typically they'll take each comment and match it up to each different provision and then analyze it and see what, whether they need to make any changes. And so a, a normal regulation might take a year to finalize. Um, one person, not in the government, but one person not in the government suggested that it would take three years for something this complex. Um, and I kind of accepted that when it was said, but then I went back and I thought about um, Code Section 385 uh, talks about uh, international financing transactions, uh, very complex, and, and it talks about when you might recharacterize debt as equity. And these proposed regulations were issued in April, and they were finalized in October, just over six months since they were sent in. These proposed regulations were over 500 pages long if you count the preamble and the regulations themselves. Um, so now they did say that it was fast-tracked, and they told everybody it was fast-tracked. Um, so 
So I would say that even though maybe one to three years seems more realistic, if they really, really wanted to, they could probably accelerate it. Um, now, I mean, this, the the only reason they'd want to accelerate it really to me would be if if, uh, if Donald Trump got elected, because um, Hillary Clinton, I mean, she has the same philosophy as President Obama on estate taxes, and so she would probably just let them go through in due course. If Donald Trump got elected, um, then um, then he would probably strongly dislike these proposed regulations, and he'd tell the IRS to put them on the shelf, stop working on them. Um, However, it does seem like Donald Trump is doing everything he can do not to get elected. So it, it's, you know, you take it with a grain of salt. Um, if he doesn't get elected, there's no reason to accelerate, which also means there might not be a reason to accelerate your planning either. Now, this is all just speculation, so I don't know. The other thing is that there's some possible legislation out there. And there's, there have been some bills proposed that would that would say – that the, that the IRS is not allowed to finalize these regulations. Um, those were introduced to Congress. Um, they're not expected to be acted on before the election. Um, why, why wouldn't they act on them before the election? Well, um, people are going around campaigning against the estate tax, and they're saying, look, the IRS is trying to reach into your pocket. I'm going to protect you. You have to reelect me so I can protect you. So it's a good election issue for people to campaign on. So. The, the legislation is not really expected to advance until after the election. So the legislation might prevent it from being enacted. So who knows? What are some things that you could do um, right now in, in, in light of having these proposed regulations? Um, so some of the things that you could do um, might be, first of all, make your transfers now. And there's a few different levels for it. Um, you could make, um, you know, gift sales, other t tools. Um, one of them is um, you you transfer all of your interest so that there's never going to be any future interest to, for these to attack. You might um, transfer enough to reduce your threshold, your ownership below 50%. Again. Um, first of all, the client's interest below 50%, so the family might still own more than 50%, so these regs might apply. But if the client's interest is below 50%, um, then, um, then they probably would not be considered to have a liquidation right if the IRS is really saying that they're going to give respect to any liquidation right that requires a majority vote. Um, another thing to do would be to reduce the client's holding to, to below whatever liquidation right threshold there is in the agreement, but I don't think that would really fully address those issues. Again, you can consider revising the governing documents to require a level of consent for liquidation that's higher than what the client owns now, but that might or may not help. Um, we talked about 50-50 property causing the proposed regs to apply. One lawyer suggested to me that each owner contribute a small equal amount to a code section 501C4, 501 parentheses, lowercase c, parentheses, for organization. Um, those gifts don't count as gifts, um, and, um, and now everybody, each person is below 50-50, and, and family attribution would not apply. Um, review buy-sell agreements to consider whether any estate tax would apply under these rules, and plan for who should pay that tax. But be careful. If the provision existed on October 8, 1990, um, that's grandfathered. The, the rules don't apply to that, so we don't want to undo our grandfathering. Also, the proposed regulations respect a commercially reasonable restriction on liquidation um, imposed by an unrelated person providing capital or equity to the entity for your, for your business operations. So think about when you have a commercial loan agreement, um, what are the restrictions that the lender is imposing? Go and document those restrictions. Um, maybe even when you take out a loan, see whether any restrictions would be consistent with your business plan and provide the lender more comfort. And, and then if those restrictions are imposed, then they will be given effect. In light of these rules, uh, you know, people are concerned about, well, if we have an entity, they'll disregard the restrictions. What if I do a tenant in common? Is a tenant in common not uh, you know, is it, is it subject to this? On face value, this rule applies just to business entities, and so a tenant in common would not appear to be included. 
um, and um, and then and you would normally you would normally get about a 15 to 20 percent fractional interest discount. And those fractional discounts are pretty well established. The last time the IRS fought having one, the taxpayer won and got assessed um, attorney's fees. The IRS had to pay the taxpayer's attorney fees. But there are some very significant risk to doing tenants in common. If the tenant in common arrangement is one where you're having the tenants in common pooling together resources in order to generate a profit, then that is considered to be a business. Under the State Law Uniform Partnership Act, when owners get together, they pool their assets together to form a profit, that is a general partnership under the Uniform Partnership Act. And there are really, to me, a couple of, of important consequences. First of all, joint and several liability. You have your tenant in common, you thought you were okay, but boom, all of a sudden, now you're responsible for whatever your co-owner does. Unlimited joint and several liability, not a pretty sight. Um, the other thing is that under the Uniform Partnership Act, a general partner has an unqualified right to withdraw. The partnership agreement is not allowed to prevent the partner from withdrawing. Um, so you can provide that there might be, if there's some damages, then you'll buy the withdrawal, then you'll assess them, but you can't provide that. So what you've done potentially is You've taken something that had a business entity that had some restrictions that may or may not have been respected, and you've put it into a business entity that has an unqualified right of withdrawal. So you've actually gone out of the frying pan and into the fire. Um, another thing to consider, if somebody really doesn't want a tenant in common, is there any way you can have an entity that will give you a tenant in common treatment? We don't know what the what the government has in mind for what these other arrangements are that are like a business entity, but there is one type of entity that generates tenant of common treatment under the income tax laws. Now, before I go over this, let me give you this caveat. The 2704 proposed regulations say that they're gonna go according to state law rights, not according to income tax law. So what I'm about to tell you applies for income tax law. It might not necessarily apply for estate and gift tax treatment. So, so take it with a grain of salt. But there is something called a Delaware Statutory Trust. And, and by the way, I'm in my newsletter materials I sent out to you because my newsletter had, a, a, a comment, had an article on this. Um, so in my newsletter, we have this on the Tennessee comment. And so this Delaware Statutory Trust is basically a tenant and common arrangement. And, and think of it this way. Some tenants in common, um, some, somebody puts, to, puts in a master lease, and the master lease has all the rules in there. The tenant is paying all the expenses and totally running the, the show, but just simply forking over their rent every month, okay? So you have this, this master lease with this real estate, and you transfer the real estate into this Delaware Statutory Trust, and, and then you simply sell your interest in Del Delaware Statutory Trust to various people. So those uh, Delaware Statutory Trust, those interests in it are considered to be tenants in common. Um, but that's really because this trust is not really managing the business. It's just sitting back and collecting a rent check. So, so there's a Delaware Statutory Trust. Um, it could help you avoid the liability, um, but I'm not sure um, whether it would actually be effective or not. But I just wanted to point that out. So. Um, avoiding income taxation of life insurance and buy-sell agreements. If there's a company-owned policy that is issued or materially changed after October 17, 2006, this applies. Um, now, originally, these rules applied um, because there was a company, think of somebody like Walmart, where they have tons, you know, thousands and thousands of employees. And, and, what, and what this company did that, that got a lot of attention is it took out life insurance on all of its employees. Not just the key executives, but the baggers, the greeters, the people who stock the floor, everybody. They had so many employees that they could predict like clockwork how many deaths there would be. 
and the rate and the return they got on the life insurance was so predictable it was just like interest, but it was tax free interest. So what you'd have is the company was receiving the equivalent of tax free interest and it was profiting from the untimely demise of its line of its line workers. So that was not very uh very nice. Um your hus your you know, your husband died, sorry about that. I made some money off of it, but tough luck family. Um so so this law was enacted, but it applies not just to employees, but to anybody who owns at least 5%. So you could be a partner in a partnership and you're not an employee, it still applies to you as long as you own at least 5%. Notice and consent must be obtained on or before the policy issuance. Um, and and the, the issue is if you don't get it before or on or before the policy issuance, then the life insurance is going to be subject to income tax. Big problem. So I have a sample notice and consent for an owner who's not an employee. And on slide 16, I have the sample one for an, for an employee. On slide 17 is a link to a webinar that I did with my partner, Georgia Lucas de Miros, um, that, uh, that talked about about these issues in more detail. So if you want to go and listen to an hour on buy sell agreements and all this life insurance stuff, you can go and click on that. I want you to know that you you can get those of you who do not subscribe to my newsletter but heard about this otherwise, you can email me to get my business structure materials, which are over 1,100 pages. And by the way, even what you just sent out today, I've I've been working on even today, and I have a little bit more details on 2704 under it. So. You could email me and and get those those uh, materials, and and I have a free quarterly newsletter that includes the most recent version, a link to the most recent version, and so I encourage people to to email me to get the PDF, and and also let me know whether you want the, the quarterly version. <clears throat> on on January 24th, <clears throat> at the same time, I'm going to be pre presenting a webinar based on my fourth quarter newsletter, and I'm going to be discussing some insights from Hackerlink. There's kind of a little theme to me here with you know what what what's being done here with these with these regulations and all the furor over them and that and that's something that um that Senator Russell Long who who chaired the Senate Finance Committee for many years um he said don't tax you don't tax me tax the man behind the tree that's, that's something that Jonathan Blotmacher has mentioned to me uh several times before and I thought it really is is a good one to apply cuz the man behind the tree, we really don't know who these proposed regulations under 2704 are going to get. So one question I got is um, somebody says well, that John Blotmacher thinks that that um, there's an interpretation that this will be much ado about nothing, um, that there's a chance that most of our valuation discounts will be only minority um, impacted by the proposed regs. And, and, and actually, I think what Jonathan is concerned about is that there's a deemed put right um, that's his, that's his main concern, um, but if you took the the, the position that um, things we hear from the government representatives, they're kind of like, well, no, we're not really trying to create a put right. They emphatically deny creating a deemed put right. So they emphatically deny saying, I'm not going to take away all minority discounts. Um, so, um, so there are several people who say, and not just Jonathan, but several others, well, gee, um, if you are are just doing a little bit, you're not taking away all discounts, just some, and you're still preserving most of your traditional valuation concepts, um, then maybe you're not changing the value by all that much. And um, And the answer is that might very well be the end result. These proposed regulations are written in a way that you can interpret them as if it is much ado about nothing, or you can interpret them as if there's some kind of a, of a right to liquidate. And, and, and the truth is probably somewhere in between, but we don't know what they are. Nobody knows the answer. And some excellent lawyers debate themselves till they're blue in the face. It's interesting, um, one of the people who um, 
who was arguing that it really, really doesn't affect things all that much, said, said, look, it's like you are talking about balls and strikes, and, and I'm talking about going bowling. And the government officials are showing up carrying a bowling bag. And I said, you know, you're perfectly right. Unfortunately, if these proposed regulations were filed as is, the judge who interprets them might be a major league baseball umpire who has never gone bowling before. So, so the, and, and you're not going to have these government officials who are telling us that, that they're not taking away too much. They are not going to be whispering into the ear of the, of the IRS examiner. They're not going to be whispering into the ear of the judge. Okay, All these people are going to be looking at the regulations. And, and like I said, it can, be, it can be very dramatic. It can be maybe not so dramatic. We just don't know. Um, so uh, one question says, so the three-year rule will not apply for gifts made before the regulation effective date, and the donor dies within three years but after the regs became effective. And yes, that's what I said that I that I believe the government will put into the final regulations, but there is no, you know, until it actually happens, it hasn't happened, okay? So that was my best guess, but I can't tell you it's so because I don't know. I'm not the one in charge of them. Do you think that the use of preferred partnerships will be impacted by these valuations, or are they still a viable planning option? And and I, the preferred partnerships, um, now there is a little bit of change in some of the family attribution rules under 2701 in these proposed regs. So. So there's a little bit of a change when you go through 2701, but generally, um, I think that I don't think that 2701 is necessarily going to apply so much. Let's let's take a step back and look at how 2701 generally works. So how 2701 generally works is um, you you have a you have an interest as a preferred return, and and then, and, and the preferred partner will get the first X dollars worth of profit. So like the first million dollars of profits goes back to the preferred partner. So as an example, partner puts in, partner has a $12 million capital account, gets a preferred return of the first million dollars of income. Any income above and beyond that million goes to the other partners. Any liquidation beyond that first 12 million that they put in goes to the other partners, the common partners. So that's generally how a preferred partnership works. So what we actually are trying to do when you have a preferred partnership interest is, we like to put lots of valuation bells and whistles on the preferred partnership interest. Why? Because the preferred return is based on the ability of the owner to extract those profits. How can the preferred partner force the partnership to distribute that first million dollars to him? So what we try to do, if it's hard for them to, to extract that money out, then it's a more risky investment and the rate of return has to go up. So instead of having maybe an 8% return required, it's a 10 or 12% return. Well, the idea for these preferred partnerships is to not have as much money coming back to the preferred partner. If you put restrictions on it, then you have to have a higher rate of return coming back to the person who's trying to get rid of the money. So what we try to do in a preferred partnership is we try to make it easy for the preferred partner to liquidate. We want that $12 million they put in to be worth $12 million. The goal is not to get discounts on that. The goal is to shift future growth. So, um, so I, I really don't see um, people wanting to play valuation games on the preferred partnership interest because they want to keep the value up. So I do think they are viable. Um, and, and in fact, you know, one of the things that all these regulations are kind of aimed at is these, what, what are viewed as artificial discounts that are being taken. 
and um, and these and these perceived artificial discounts. Um, how does the IRS attack them? They don't have a good mechanism now. That's why they're putting in these 24, 27 to four proposed regs. So what they are going to what they what they really try to do now is they try to make an argument under twenty thirty six. They say the whole thing is included in your state under twenty thirty six, so there's no discounts. So that's a very rough uh, result. Uh, and in a, and, but there are some cases that say that 2701, all the, all the whole framework for it was designed to avoid having bells and whistles on your preferred return that you can later on ignore. And, and they said 2701 is good enough to shut down abuses. And we are not going to apply 2036. There's a case called Hutchins, a case called Boykin. It's in my longer business structuring materials. Um, so I think that, that about covers that particular issue. Um, I, I don't see any more questions up here. Um, so I'll, I'll take another moment just to, just to talk about um, some more uh, planning things uh, to think about. I mean, one one of them is uh, what about basis step up? So, the 2704 proposed regulations apply for gift, estate, and generation skipping transfer tax purposes, just for those purposes. Now, when you get your basis step up of death, that's Code Section 1014, which is an income tax provision. It's not an estate gift or generation skipping transfer provision. So these artificial increases in value do not on their face get you a basis step up. Now I'm gonna walk away from that in just a minute, take that back a little bit, but, but start with the premise they're not necessarily gonna get you a basis step up. Now some people say, well, what about the basis consistency regulations? Well, the basis consistency rules say the basis can't be any more than the estate tax value, but they don't say that the basis can't be less than the estate tax value. So the basis consistency regs do not give us any comfort. What does give us comfort, potentially, under Code Section 1014, um, there's a regulation that says that if you obtain an appraisal for purposes of estate tax reporting, then your basis is that value. So basically the value shown on the estate tax return will be your basis under that regulation. So if you file an estate tax return, then that regulation will apply and you would get your basis step up, at least that's my take on it. If you don't file an estate tax return, then that regulation would not apply and it doesn't appear that you would get a basis step up. Now. I believe the comments are going to suggest to the government that they give us a basis step up for these um, for these trans for these uh, rules. Um, it's kind of a little bit dicey. The 2704-3 regs talk about interests that are transferred, so there is something to attach a basis step up to. But in the other ones where the where the where the value is kind of dis deemed to disappear, um, and you're just taxed on that value. Is there really a property interest that gets that value associated with it? So it's really unclear how that would apply. Um, it would, and, and again, people are going to be asking for the government to to provide some relief and give you a basis step up for that. Um, whether the government is going to do that or not, um, nobody knows. I don't think they're required to. Um, I hope that you uh, will uh, will attend the next uh, webinar that we have in January. Uh, and and for those of you who are going to Heckerling. Um, I'm going to be speaking there on a panel with Steve Tritton, Mickey Davis, and Jonathan Blotmacher, um, and on, uh, on designing the, 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 the best trust. Uh, and so I hope to see some of you there as well. Thank you for attending.